but I was really interested also in how climate change would be impacting our health. And so while I was in my master's program at UC Davis, they had One Health, which is an intersection between human health, animal health, and environmental health. So really how they all can truly So for example, if an animal, um, for example, a chicken has salmonella, and I am touching that chicken and handling it, then I could potentially get myself sick because they do carry the pathogen salmonella. And when, for example, and I'll get this in my um, actual research, if you go to a fair and you have a bunch of animals that are mixed together, and fairs tend to happen during the summer, so it's hotter, and with the global warming, the temperatures can be even warmer. And when animals are in a stressful environment, you know, when you're having a warmer climate, then they'll shed more of those pathogens. Uh, and after my master's program, I went on to the California Department of Public Health to emphasize in epidemiology. And epidemiology is a study of patterns and trends of diseases in certain populations. And right now, I'm a clinical disease investigator at the County of San Mateo. So I'm fairly young in my career, and I am still very much learning. Okay, so what is public health? Can anyone take a guess? Just whatever comes to mind. It also is uh, pretty predatory in the term itself. Yes? Yes, you said the health of the public, definitely. Anyone else? You don't pay for it, so, so, so public services. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Trips that come to mind or events that have occurred? Community. Community? Yes, thank you. Community, definitely. The community that you live in, that you work in, will affect your health, everyone's health around you. Okay. So, yes, public health <coughs> is everything. Public health is your built environment, where you live, where you work, where you play, and how those exposures around you will impact your health. It's also, as I mentioned, you know, air quality, water quality, um, housing that you're available, it's infectious diseases that you can contract, um, and again, that's where you work, how safe that environment is for you. So there really isn't one definition for public health, but the one that tends to get used is when it follows. It's the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts and important choices of society, organizations, public and private communities, and individuals. And that was said by uh, Charles Edward Emory Winslow, he was a leading figure in developing the structure of public health. Okay, so while I was a student, as I mentioned, I was really interested in how human, humans, the environment, and animals were interacting. So I created a study to go to county fairs throughout California to assess uh, human behavior around animals. My main question for this study was to learn how or do biosecurity practices influence hygiene behavior? Biosecurity practices are methods and approaches to help reduce risks to human environmental and animal health. So for example, in this instance, whether or not uh, hand washing signage was available or if you had a sink where you could wash your hands. So uh, we have many outbreaks throughout the United States uh, with a number of diseases. And in my particular study, I was focusing on Salmonella, um, Campylobacter, um, E. coli, just for example. These are all bacteria. And animals will shed these bacteria, these pathogens. And what I did was observe at random people that walked into the barns to see if they washed their hands when they entered the barn 
and if they touched an animal or any animal, you know, pen, uh, and then if they washed their hands upon exiting the boat. I also wanted to see, again, if the barns even had this available for, for, fair, for fair goers to actually use. So barns were also assessed to see if hand washing signage was available to encouraging fair goers to wash their hands. And also they had more hand washing features available. So you can't wash your hands if there's no you know, station there for you to do so. All right, so as I mentioned, my objectives were to assess whether or not fair visitors you know, utilized hand washing, sign, uh, hand washing stations, and if hand washing stations were available at the fairs. And this image is an example of one of the stations that I, was video, that I saw at the fair. It's a portable station, portable station meaning that um, you can pump you know, water with your foot, and then you also have soap available. There's also a sign on this particular uh, station. The way that I selected barns was by choosing, I intentionally chose barns that had signage and stations because I wanted to be able to assess whether or not fair goers used um, the stations. And another consideration again was whether or not there was signage available at the barns. So the way that I gathered my data was again to determine if the fair visitor wash their hands at the entrance, at the exit, touch any animals or animal pens. And with this data, I was able to create a risk score to determine how risky someone's behaviors were. So in this instance, a higher score indicated lower risk. And I did a similar um, method with the barns. If a barn had signage encouraging visitors to wash their hands, they got a point. If the barns had a uh, hand washing station, they got another point. So, you know, when, you, when you're doing a study, really all you need is for it to be original. This isn't you know, rocket science. It's very basic about hand washing, but it is different and unique in that there haven't been really any studies assessing fair visitor hand washing at fairs. And so this figure is showing the uh, frequency of uh, type of bar and, uh, hand washing station. So you can see that almost half, 50% of barns did not have any hand washing station available. And then 36 point, three, about 36% about had a portable sink available. Um, 9% had an alcohol-based hand rub available. And Another 9% actually had a physical seat for use, available for use. And these, those, those are important findings because you want to get a sense of what's actually available what out there for the visitors to use. So we also found that 75% of fair participants had contact with an animal, but only 3% actually washed their hands when they left the barn. And if you can see it from these images, you can see the, the sheep on the left, it has its hooves on the railing, and this pig has its mouth on the railings as well. You know, usually when you're going through a barn, you might see younger kids, you know, being at that level and being against to also touch and reach out these animals. But that's also why we're concerned because younger kids um, have a lot of high touch contact. They put their hands in their mouth, they touch their toys, they touch you. And all the way on the right, we have um, some soiled uh, uh, pen. So there's a, it's hard to tell, but there's actually urine on this, um, in this uh, pen right here. And so if we have these animals walking around and eating, you know, from these areas, and they're touching you, they potentially be infecting you with their packages that they shed. And I did do also some analysis, and I did have, um, significant association between hand washing and hand washing signage being available. So my conclusions from this project were that signage does help you know, promote uh, hand washing. 
on the top right, you can see an image of one of the um, students' signs saying that you better wash your hands. Um, and I, when I say students, when you go to county fairs, those animals are typically brought by uh, students in programs called 4 H Youth or FFA. They're, they're programs where they raise livestock. And these outbreaks can be prevented by you know, educating these youth. If we educate them to maintain the livestock pen by feeding them regularly to get rid of the urine and feces, it will help reduce the, the potential for spreading disease. And we also want to encourage your know, county fairs to have hand washing things available at every barn. They weren't available at every barn. If they were, sometimes it might be blocked by some other item. So I want to thank, you know, for this study, my advisors and the team that I worked with to give you a bit more, better idea of public health you know, from the way that we work with public health. All these individuals come from a different you know, background. A handful are in veterinary medicine, others you know, work in labs, and then I, I primarily manage public health and focusing on people. So the nice thing about public health is that you're always, you're always collaborating with other organizations and individuals, and so it really is a collaborative effort. Okay, now I want to go over what I currently do at work in my current role as a disease investigator. So, how many of you have heard of an outbreak? Okay. What are some examples of outbreaks that you have heard of? Ebola. Ebola? Yes, Ebola. Flu? Which one? Measles outbreak. Measles, yes, exactly. Yes, E. coli, yes, thank you. Yes, so typically you, you learn of an outbreak once it's reached at the state or national level. The work that I do is in the county is on a local level, so, you know, ideally you would never hear of that. You would never learn about the work that we do behind the scenes helping to keep you safe. So, on a daily basis, we do get reports of local outbreaks. Um, the majority of these outbreaks would not get, you know, um, would not require additional follow-up by the state health department. A local health department are trying to, you know, again, mitigate it from getting out of control. So our role is infection control and prevention. And whenever we learn of a potential outbreak, we always request lab confirmation to see if we can identify the actual organism. We conduct follow-up with cases by interviewing them. And then in those interviews, we collect data like symptoms, onset date, and exposures. And after assessing the situation, we'll offer recommendations or education. And these interviews are only their examples of different kinds of um, organisms. On the left, you have a virus or influenza, and on the right, it's salmonella bacteria. So I did leave some key terms, you know, on the uh, seats throughout the, the room that weren't enough for everyone, so if you have any, go ahead and share. So we will get there, we'll be up here. So they're mainly for reference, but before we go over this is an activity that we have, we'll be leading them. So I work in communicable diseases, and those are known as to be passed person to person, and I conduct disease surveillance, meaning I'm constantly collecting data and inputting it to our reporting system. And the pathogens that I've mentioned, your salmonella, um, campylobacter, are organisms that cause illness. A case definition is, it includes criteria for person, place, and time, in addition to clinical features like symptoms. An incubation period is the time between when you were actually infected to when you began to uh, manifest symptoms. And some additional key terms include risk factors, meaning uh, exposures that can increase your risk of contracting a certain illness. So for example, an example of salmonella, if you're working closely <coughs> with a good example of chickens and you're constantly in their poop, you know, cleaning out their feces, you could pretend you're increasing your risk to getting that illness because chickens do naturally carry salmonella. 
So signs and symptoms, is that is something that you see with don't feel? Uh, for example, I might have, you know, really red eyes. I can't feel like I have red eyes, but you can see that. A symptom is something that you, you, you experience, like stomach pain, but you can't really see it. Symptomatic and symptomatic just mean that you're either expressing symptoms or you're not. And an outbreak is when we see a really fast increase in what we would typically see uh, for a sort of illness or injury. So, some examples of outbreaks that we typically see at the health department include gastrointestinal, that's a fecal, uh, oral um, sort of illness, meaning that you had to have come into contact with feces, contaminated feces, and that can be by drinking, you know, contaminated water, or by eating food that's been contaminated, or by having direct contact with an item or animal that has that bacteria. And respiratory that spreads through the air. And some common symptoms of respiratory include cough, fever, a sore throat, for example. Okay, so I have an activity for us to do about measles. As somebody mentioned, um, there is currently a pretty big outbreak taking place in Washington State. There have been 64 confirmed cases of measles, and measles is a preventable disease if you just you buy a vaccine, that's the second number of vaccine if you're interested, and you likely would have been vaccinated if you're going to a public school in California. Let's see. And measles is one of the ones that we get notified of. So there are about 80 diseases, diseases in California that doctors and laboratories are required to notify us about. So let's say, you know, I have a fever of like 100 degrees, and I have, I'm super tired, so I have fatigue, and I'm coughing a lot. I go to the doctor, my doctor <coughs> takes a test, and it gets processed, and it comes back for influenza. We will be immediately notified of those results, because we are trying to prevent, you can get other people sick and help you recover. So if we know, because if they find out that I have influenza, then they'll go through an interview with me to figure out where did I go? Did I travel? What exposures did I have? Did I um, eat at a certain location? Did I hang out with people um, that were passing through in a hostel? And all that follow-up really help us identify the different kinds of ways you may have been exposed, but also to help us figure out who you would have had contact with to follow up with them to figure out how they're doing, if they're sick, and any um, contacts they may have. And that's because, you know, we never really know any one person's medical history. Like, I could tell you, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty healthy person, but you might not know I have diabetes. And people who have diabetes can be more vulnerable to certain illnesses, um, because of, of a weakened immune system, including people you know, who are undergoing chemotherapy. So it's really valuable to have these interviews conducted to learn more about each person's situation and we can assess each individual to help the public overall. And so measles is a highly contagious disease and it spreads through the air. So if you're sitting next to somebody or if you're on um, and if you're waiting like in a clinic room or on an airplane, those are uh, more like higher risk settings to be in with somebody that has measles. A higher risk of you actually also you know, getting, potentially getting that illness. So for measles, the incubation period is 7 to 21 days. And the incubation period, which we mentioned earlier, is um, how long it takes for you to actually start to you know, express symptoms, so from your moment that you have the exposure to the time that you actually begin to have symptoms. And the infectious period, for measles in particular, it's four days before rash onset through four days after rash onset. And let me get to that. So for, this is an example of an actual rash for measles, it's an actual papal rash, meaning that it's flat but also is raised a little bit. Um, there also are, uh, in the mouth at times, what we call poplic spots. There are white spots 
that is pretty identifiable uh, for measles. And so, you know, it typically begins, maybe you might think it's a cold because you have like a cough, a runny nose, um, maybe some pink eye, and you might also have diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. So a lot of these illnesses, they start off the same way. You go, it's only a cold, um, you know, until a couple of days pass by or a few days pass by and it worsens. <coughs> so for measles, you know, the, the really the, the first symptoms to begin tend to be a fever followed by the rash. And then a couple of days later, you, you might have those uh, white spots in your mouth. And then the fever will get even worse. And the rash, the way it starts, is typically on your face, on your neck, down to your chest, and eventually go down to your thighs, legs, and feet. And it always goes in that fashion from top to bottom. And when it clears, it'll go back the way that it came, bottom to top. Yeah, so her question is, if somebody had uh, measles as a kid, can you get it when you're older? So for measles, if you had it as a kid, it is less likely that you will have it as an adult. Like, very less likely. There's no 100% guarantee, but it does provide your know, lifelong immunity. Okay, so for our, our activity, our case definition, is going to be, and you must have fever at the rash onset, so when your rash starts, you must have at least one of the three C's being cough, coryza, or runny nose, and conjunctivitis. The rash must have started on the head or the neck and progressed downward. And the symptoms should have started eight days after your exposure. Okay, so I, Distributed some uh, papers with numbers on them. Whoever has number one, could you? It's up here because you figured it out. And if it's unclean next to you, please go ahead and take it and read it. You received a phone call from Dr. Wu regarding a 67-year-old patient that was seen at the emergency room for rash on the neck and a chest that developed today, February 20, 2019. Dr. Wu is seeking guidance since the patient visited the emergency, emergency room and recently returned from Washington State, where measles outbreak is ongoing. Okay. So considering what we just talked about, you know, um, some people having an increased risk and knowing that there's currently an outbreak going on in Washington, what would be one of your first steps? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, so currently we're, 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 we are all now investigators. As an investigator, to give this doctor guidance, what are, what are some concerns that you have that you would want to address for the doctor? Yes. There's still being exposed to other individuals. Right. So is this patient that the doctor thinks has measles still exposing other individuals? Thank you. Quarantine. Are they being quarantined? Right. Thank you. So for those who don't know, quarantine um, so there's quarantine and isolation. Typically, those who are currently ill, we isolate. And those that are healthy would be quarantined to help keep them from getting sick. So would this person still be, would they, would they be isolated and are they still exposing other individuals? So what about them being in the ER? Any concerns there? Do they have a fever, right? Symptoms, what are they? Right. Okay. And so, who has number two? It's up here also. Okay. 
So the doctor notes that the patient also had a fever for 24 hours about two weeks ago. Right. They had a fever, but it was two weeks ago. So we're still trying to figure out if this person actually had measles, and we're trying to figure out next steps to do a lot of follow-up. So these are, this is a real example of cause that we have gone in um, at the health department. Who has number three? Or if it's nearby and you see it, would you please read it? Okay. You advise Dr. Boo to be on airborne precautions. Yes. So addressing the questions that were already um, or concerns that our, our investigators mentioned, you know, is this person still exposing other people or being isolated? <coughs> One of our first steps was to keep that person, you know, from infecting other individuals. So when we get a call from a doctor and that patient is being seen, they're advised to keep this person in a room that has negative pressure, meaning that the air, you know, is being taken out and the door opens and we escape into the hallway. So they are currently being isolated and uh, watched and any, um, you know, nursing staff or doctors that go into that room are aware to have to be on careful precautions, wearing the right, you know, equipment, protective gear, to protect themselves as well before going into that room. Okay, number four. Is that happening? Okay, I'm going to let the volunteers. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You call the patient to acquire additional details. The patient informs you that they just returned home to San Mateo County after visiting family in Washington State. Dates to travel were 02-15-19 to 02 The patient also mentioned that they have also had a cough and is experiencing nausea. Okay, so you have been able to track down your patient and get through, get through to them. That is um, actually a challenge that is actually getting through to our patients. So if you ever get a phone call or a letter from the local health department, please do follow up because we are trying to want to protect you but also to get our community. So as was mentioned up here, we called the patient and we got additional details. The patient confirms that they were in Washington State, and they gave you dates for when they were there. The dates of travel were February 15th through the 18th, so over the long weekend. And you know, one of the reasons why the doctor called us was because they were the, the patients um, traveled to Washington State increased their concerns since there is an ongoing outbreak in Washington State. But thankfully, through our good investigative skills, we learned the actual dates of travel. So we, we see that um, the earliest that they were in Washington State was five days ago since the rash started today. So also consider, you know, looking back at our notes, um, considering you know, the time that it takes for um, the rash to start after exposure. So we, will, we have here that the incubation period is 7 to 21 days, and the infectious period is four days before rash onset date. But right now we're really looking at the incubation period, 7 to 21 days. And right now, you know, if Washington State was a primary concern, we're not really quite meeting that criteria. We're at five days, but still we can't really you know, pull it out there because it's a very uh, contagious illness. Okay, number five. You try to determine if the patient might be immune to the and ask about vaccination status. The patient informs you that they were born in the Philippines and recalls having had measles, but they do not have any documentation of this. Thank you. So we had a question earlier on today, you know, we had you had it as a 
is, do you have immunity? So that, that's also why we ask that question, because if we can determine that the person has had the vaccine, or they've had the illness, and they have actual documentation of that, we can breathe and relax, you know, that greatly reduces our concern for measles. But however, as our patient indicated, he thinks he has it, but he has no documentation. And the value of knowing where he was born is that when there are certain, um, you know, again, if you go, to, you go to public school here at a certain age, then you're required to get vaccinated. If you were born before, I think, like 1957, you likely already had measles um, and, and, and thereby had immunity. Um, and there are several other factors that help us determine immunity. If you, do you know that you were vaccinated? Do you have those records? And so the the greatest help in that question is that it greatly reduces the amount of follow up that's needed and the heightened concern in the office. Number six, is the last one. Patient calls you back because they forgot to tell you that their rash is itchy. You confirm with the patient that they just switched to a new shampoo yesterday. <laughs> Great, thank you. So now the patient has told us, you know, the rash is pretty itchy and also trying to do a shampoo. So considering, you know, this information about the incubation period, you know, again, for measles really being a minimum of seven days, and ours right now we have five days in our timeline, and um, the fact that the rash, uh, the fever, I think as Kathy noted, was two weeks before the rash even began, and then also that the, the, the rash is itchy. With measles, the rash doesn't tend to be itchy. So with these factors in mind, our concern for um, infection is greatly reduced, and we ultimately do leave it up to the choice of the provider, whether or not they want to move forward with um, the possibility of measles, and if that were um, of a greater concern than what would happen is we would actually collect specimens from the patient and those specimens would then go on to the health department for testing to determine if they had immunity to measles. And if immunity cannot be determined, then they are required to stay on um, active uh, symptom watch, meaning that they have to be at home like, without any contact with anybody and looking out for symptoms for the next 21 days. So that's why we really try to figure out, you know, determine if somebody's had vaccines or, um, again, if they are immune to the illness. Because if that person, if we move forward with testing, not only will we do that for that one person, every person that this um, individual had contact with would also have to be followed up with to learn their immunity status and determine if they have to be at home checking out for symptoms as well. So it's a lot of work and you know we try to keep everybody healthy. As I mentioned, you know, it's really is the provider to figure to determine whether or not they want to move forward with the provider to the one assessing clinically the patient. And so in this uh, real situation, one of the doctors reported to us, you know, I have a patient here that I think has measles, but it's a low suspicion, meaning that it's on a higher risk. And after multiple days of conversations with San Francisco Airport, because the patient had traveled, and with the state department, the doctor reported, well, you know, the patient, um, I think it's more like a local dermatitis because the patient switched their shampoo. And because the way that you know you push and pull your hair when you, when you rinse it off, it's going to go to go down your neck and your back. So that's why the rash that they had was similar to the progression of measles. But it really, you know, really goes by, it's really by your great investigative uh, skills and the questions that you ask that they're able to determine that this is more of a lower risk and not really high concern for measles. Nice work. So we did this. Okay, so I gave you some examples of the work that I've done as a graduate student, and now I'm in current role as, as, an, as an investigator. And now I would like to offer some advice for you currently as students and for your careers. So when I was a student, I relied heavily on my classmates. 
I had a study buddy for every class, and I often joined in study groups to study for exams and also review notes and content. Um, I was a frequent uh, visitor of office hours for many of my professors. It's also, office hours um, are also a really great chance to get to know the third, the third move here, to get to know the professors. Um, you know, they are also professionals and have gone through their own, their own journeys to get to where they are. And also, you know, they might be a reference for you or write a letter of recommendation. So if they get to know you better and you see your, um, your devotion by going to office hours and or to the class, then they're more likely to be able to actually buy you a strong letter of recommendation. And I also, um, when I say ask for help, I also mean classmates. Your classmates are probably one of your best resources <coughs> because they're actually going through it with you. And I remember I once asked a classmate in my cell biology class. She always got A's on her exams, and I was getting B's or maybe C's. And so I looked at her, you know, uh, Julia, I've noticed that I know you do really well on your exams. Uh, do you have any study tips? And so it was a really easy way for me to get to want to know her, but also learn what she does. And then I even got to study with her once. I mean, I even studied with her, so I got to learn, you know, what she does to remember information and how she's processing the information. So maybe I was missing something. So don't be afraid to ask somebody because even if, for help. And for a career, I definitely would say you know, explore your opportunities. As you can tell, I, I, I was really torn between you know, human health and environmental health for a long time, and I'm still you know, trying to figure out how to find them, but I think that I'm in a good place right now. But by exploring different classes, not um, sticking to one you know, genre, one topic, I really was able to expand um, my knowledge, but also the way that I think and what I might be interested in. Because when I was a student, I was really, I really focused on a topic. You know, I want to learn more about um, animal behavior, or I want to learn more about um, like Nazi Germany. But if you focus on gaining certain skills rather than, um, while also you're learning about the content, that might actually help you in the long run because you'll learn how to write an essay, you know, and so that you can incorporate that into your work when you're writing reports about the follow up you're doing for certain illnesses. I also definitely recommend networking. That has been one of the greatest tools that I have been utilized in throughout my career. You know, I got my first job here. I mean, I had, I had the skills in the background to fill the role, but it's really because I followed up with Kathy and told her, you know, I'm interested in this. And it was still job printing, so they it was an opening, and I was able to take that role on. And also with internships, when I was at Stanford, um, I actually emailed the professor six times, and she never responded. But she responded, but it was never a no. So you know, I would wait a couple of weeks, maybe a month here and there, and finally she invited me to come visit her lab and offered me to work with her for a year. So networking and persistence, you know, is really valuable. And I really do agree with having a conversation. I know that networking can be people nervous thinking you're asking for something or a handout. So really what you're doing is getting to know people. If you're speaking with somebody and you're not connecting, it probably won't get pretty won't get very far anyway. So you're establishing connections with people and having conversations about who you are, what your interests are, and where you want to go, maybe they can help you, and they will. And I recommend doing so with individuals both in and outside of your field to never know uh, where it will take you. So I want to thank you again to everyone, especially you all for being here. So, 
Her question is, people run up front, so maybe have a different class to go to, so please feel free to go, you know, where you have to. Um, her question is about uh, what she goes, why somebody with, who is younger than 50 would be with a shot. I actually have to get back to you on that. Um, there are eight diseases that we follow up with, and I constantly am up to see my notes. But I do know that the sheet, for those of you who don't know, she was usually wet um, for individuals who um, may have you know, had to put something under, they get it together with order, but it's not like she was. So I don't know, but I don't know if I'm going to call it. Hello. 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 Prevention and the California Department of Public Health, those are excellent um, 
websites that you can go to to learn more about these images to give you, you know, uh, helpful information. You know, a lot of the time, the zombie disease, I think that that's a, the media trying you know, to get readers to, to read the document. And although it, it you know, can be helpful and really helping people learn more about you know, these really you know, unique zoonotic diseases, it can also, there's scare tactics to get, you know, to get impact readers. So, um, you know, that is a great point that you need that you will be concerned for that, but in terms of the general public, I would say it's much more than um, us really having an interaction, you know, get, like, consuming that meat or, you know, touching the, the deer, I don't know how it spreads, but um, I think that would be a very targeted population, again, like hunters, people who are hunting for game, that I think we would want to focus on educating. Thank you. One last question?
-hmm. And uh, it's like if my son had shot him when he was mm -hmm. born. Mm -hmm. And but there were some parents around the Bay Area, they are against the shot give shots to their kids. So that's the problem because if they have some you know, some disease, the kids are going to get spread, you know, so like how can you possibly so one of our concerns, you know, is um, there in some counties in California, the Bay Area in particular, there is a strong anti-vaccine uh, movement, um, and mainly due to you know um, lack of education about the actual uh, you know effects of of uh, vaccines. But basically. Um, yes, I still recommend you know do get vaccinated. You know, other people are doing it because there's what's called herd immunity, meaning that you know if we're all in here, you know, like uh, get vaccinated besides ten people, the rest of us, the majority of us, are vaccinated will actually protect um, the other individuals from getting ill because we all also are also protected because we're less likely to get those illnesses since we're not getting sick. And hopefully, they also would not get sick at least. You know, being this community. You're welcome. This is why we want everybody at the STEM Center to get the flu shot. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is flu season. <laughs> um, have you had the opportunity to uh, help other communities, like going up north, like Paradise, whether it was the Norma Wires, like how many do you have the opportunity to go out to other communities and assist like those county officials? That's a good question. She's asking about, you know, how much can we collaborate with people in the different um, counties and across the, the nation? So actually, for this, uh, it was offered from Washington State. We did get um, a request for assistance. Um, you know, because outbreaks can also potentially become, you know, if there are emergencies, and sometimes you don't have enough staff or personnel to assist with the with the emergency. And so, although I did not personally want to help, there definitely was a need of people from different uh, neighboring counties and states were able to go assist at Washington to help with investigations uh, for the outbreak. Thank you. 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 Thank